My name is Ashley Pilon. I oversee the tuition reimbursement programs and alumni services at ATP Flight School. Uh, thanks for joining us. Our session today will be to discuss a career path outlook on flying for a fractional ownership company. Today we'll be joined by Mike Corrigan. He's the PC-12 chief pilot at Plain Sense, and Katie Murphy. She's an aviation recruiter with Plain Sense. Uh, for those of you that have joined our webinars before, you know that our microphone, your microphones will be muted for the duration of this session. Um, utilize the chat box in the lower right hand corner if you need to communicate with us. And then uh, we will have time at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions for Mike and Katie in the center of your toolbar at the bottom, there should be a Q&A. And from there, you'll be able to um, put the questions as you come up with them and we'll discuss them at a later point. Um, and so since we are discussing a fractional ownership company today, we're just curious, we'd like to find out if you are familiar with fractional ownership. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll and give you guys a little bit of time just to answer if you are familiar. Awesome, so it looks like about half of you are familiar, half of you aren't. And we'll go ahead and just share those results to you real quick. So it looks like 20 of you are and 22 of you are not. Um, and with that being said, I'm sure we're going to discuss that in a little bit, but um, thank you for submitting those answers and welcome Katie and welcome Mike. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for us. Awesome. So uh, to get started, I just want to find out a little bit of information if each of you can share your background um, with us and how long you've been at Plain Sense. Okay, so I've been with Plain Sense a little bit okay. over two years. I first started in um, the Flight Operations Center. And so I was an owner service representative and crew service representative. So I deal with um, booking flights for the owners and assisting crews when they were out flying. So yeah, I might have been with Plain Sense for eight years. Uh, I've been uh, in the office here for about four years. Um, before that, uh, before being in the office, I was flying the line as a regular line captain and instructor pilot, uh, became a check airman also. Um, started as a PC-12 first officer, um, and when I did start as a first officer, there was no, there's no talk of jets. We weren't talking about a jet program, PC-24s, next in jets, flying out west. It was just New England, Florida. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's how far we've come in, in eight years. So, uh, uh, but before that, um, I did some work with the, uh, the federal government and um, was a flight instructor for, for much longer than people flight instruct now. Uh, we have flight instructors on average with about 500 hours total time. I have about 3,000 hours of dual given. Um, it's just, it was a different time and uh, it, it kind of feels familiar to what we're uh, about to go through here. But So that's kind of my background. Okay, perfect. And um, can, Katie, can you maybe share with our viewers some information on your fleet and on your hiring minimums? Okay, so a little bit about our aircraft, uh, we have over, 40 aircraft in our fleet. Uh, the aircraft on the right is November 124 Alpha Foxtrot. It's one of our PC-24s. Um, we have six of these in our fleet. And then the one to the left, November 469 Alpha Fox is one of our PC-12s and we have 35 currently. Um, we also have three Nexton XTIs. Those were the interim jet um, for the PC-24. Okay. And then for hiring minimums for PC-12 first officers, uh, 750 total time will be considered but we really prefer a thousand total time. And for PC to PC direct entry captains, we look for 1500 will be considered, but 2000 is really preferred. Um, and our pilots are really our ambassadors for plane sense. Um, so we really look for pilots with strong work ethic and who can adapt to an ever changing flight schedule. Also, you must hold an FAA commercial or ATP pilot license with single engine land ratings. And your um, job postings do state that pilots have their choice of bases. So how many, uh, or how does that factor into hiring? Is there a junior base uh, or maybe one that just has a more immediate need? Yeah, so these are all of our uh, pilot reporting bases. We have over 30. Um, I can't emphasize enough that you choose your base. Um, there is not a more junior or senior base. Um, also, if you're a snowbird and you want to live in Martha's Vineyard for the summer and have Martha's Vineyard as your base, but you want to go to Florida in the winter um, to avoid the snow and you want PBI as your base in the winter, you can do that. So once you choose your base, you're not stuck with that base. You can um, move around as long as it's approved by your chief pilot. Okay, perfect. 
and, and it is a requirement also um, that you live within 100 miles of that base. Okay. And then um, how many for pilots that are flying for plane sense, how many um, hours of flight time do pilots average per year? Um, so the average amount of flight time is between 500 to seven hours per year. Um, 700 hours is going to be closer to a Portsmouth based pilot just because they don't have to airline on day one or day eight. And so 500 hours will be for a pilot based um, elsewhere other than Portsmouth. Okay. And then one of the, the areas of your operation that I've always found to be kind of just really neat is that you place emphasis on um, merit instead of just a traditional seniority list. So Mike, can you explain how this process works and uh, why Plain Sense chooses to rely on more than just seniority? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've always kind of uh, placed the emphasis on, uh, on merit. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of value in upgrading somebody to captain just because their number's up. Uh, we want good quality captains, um, and we want, we want good quality ambassadors of the company. So, uh, so we've always kind of done it that way, um, and it's always worked out uh, very well for us. Um, so basically, the, the pathway, uh, either you're hired as a direct entry captain, which is a fairly new program for us, uh, but historically, it's more of a, um, uh, a SIC that we hire and we upgrade internally at about 1,500 hours. You need at least 1,500 hours because we are part 135 as well um, to upgrade. And then, of course, you see there it says good standing with the company, which is probably the biggest one. Um, you know, just how everything's going uh, in general. You know, we, it's, it's still a small company and we could see how people operate. Uh, all of the office staff flies the line constantly, so we're always uh, seeing each other out there. Uh, we're in each other's ground schools. I mean, it's just, we're always around each other. So, uh, so again, we want to kind of grow our, uh, our captain base from, from inside so that we have the best possible ambassadors to our, uh, our owner group. Um, seniority counts for very little here. Uh, vacation is number one, uh, because it's, that's a fair way to do it, of course. Um, and then number two is our, our upgrade from PC-12 pilot to jet pilot. Um, of course, we know that Plain Sense historically has been a single engine turboprop company. The jet program is, is a fairly new thing. So there are people who have been here for six months, but then we also have people who have been here close to 20 years. So there's, there's something to be said for loyalty. So um, when we are going through a jet program, we pick from the eligible PC-12 captains. So in order to be considered for the jet, you need to first be a captain in the PC-12. So that's, that's good motivation to get in the left seat of the 12. Um, and then from there, we'll, uh, in seniority order, move people over to the left side. And that's always worked out uh, very well. It, uh, it encourages people to really stay in the game, try hard, and uh, it motivates them to, to be better. And then of course, in the meantime, while you're waiting for the jet, we have a lot of positions to be instructor pilots, check airmen internally. All of our office positions are filled from our, uh, our line pilots. So uh, those jobs are always uh, available, uh, kind of rotating around. And um, again, it ensures that we get the, the best quality people in the, uh, in the appropriate positions. Perfect, thank you. Um, and another thing, I know that there's sometimes a, a misconception because you guys are, are headquartered in the Northeast that that must be where you fly. Um, with the addition of the, the next 10 400 XTI with the Pilatus jet, uh, your range really is much farther than that. So where are some additional destinations that a plane sense pilot might uh, get to take advantage of? Yeah, so we, it's a common question that we get a lot of recruiting events uh, at career fairs and such uh, because aviation is so airline minded. Uh, people always ask, what, what kind of routes do you fly? We don't fly routes. Um, our flying is driven by the demands of our owners. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a cliche in the corporate world to say that we kind of live by the phone. It's not quite on the edge like that with us, but uh, it sort of is. So reservations will be placed with our flight operations center and we'll go where those people want us to. Um, because the company is kind of born up in the Northeast, that's how the Northeast flying really started. The majority of the flying is in the Northeast in the summertime, uh, in the Southeast also. Uh, wintertime is a lot of North to South. But uh, over the years, our flying has really expanded out West. Um, we're in Colorado several times a week. Uh, we've been in California this year. I mean, we, we fly uh, almost to all 48 states, uh, 48 lower states uh, every year consistently. 
and that that is growing. It's it's becoming very consistent. Flying in Mexico, flying in the Bahamas is very common. Uh, we've flown to Cuba, a lot of the Caribbean. Um, so it's it's tough to say where where you'll fly. Basically, what I can say is, in my eight years of flying here, when I go out flying, I still go to new airports every single week that I go out. And that's what I really enjoy about the company is that it's not JFK to Atlanta, sit for an hour and then return to JFK. It's uh, it's very dynamic, and you can see some of the stats there. Um, you know, we fly to a lot of different airports. Uh, a number that's on there uh, that's not on there. We fly on average about 900 airports a year. Even the biggest airline in the world only flies to about 700. So we're we're constantly on the move. Everything is always changing, and uh, it helps keep things uh, interesting. Awesome. And so now that we know a little bit about where you you might fly, um, let's cover when. What is a typical schedule like for a plain sense pilot, and how far in advance will a pilot know their schedule? Yeah. Um, so during initial ground school, you're going to find out your schedule. It's an eight on six off schedule, um, and that's going to be your schedule for the remainder of time unless you bid or upgrade. Um, it is a consistent schedule, so it helps with the quality of life. You're never going to miss a child's birthday or a birth or something important. If that falls on your schedule, um, your chief pilot will kind of work with you so you're, you're not going to miss that um, important life event. So right here, it shows that full-time direct entry captains and first officers are on that eight days on, six days off schedule. Um, Remote-based pilots will have more travel on day one and day eight. And for part-time direct entry captains, after completion of initial training, they'll have eight days on, six days off, um, and then 90 days on the pilot line and eight days on, 20 days off for the remainder of the year. Um, and then, Duty time, a start day is going to be Tuesday and Wednesday, week one and week two, um, 4 a.m. to 4 a.m. You'll have a maximum 14 hours of duty day. Um, most of the time, you're not going to really see that 14 hours. It's going to be a lot less. Um, and then we are fractional operations, so it's going to be a dynamic owner demand schedule. You're going to go to a wide variety of airfields, like Mike said. Um, this is a picture of one of our planes on a grass strip. So you'll be landing grass strips, short landings, um, some larger airports as well. In a typical summer flying day, you can um, see up to seven legs a day, um, short trips like Boston to Martha's Vineyard, et cetera. In a typical winter flying day, you'll have less legs and longer trips. Perfect. And um, with that being said, we're just curious, you know, are there, do you guys have tips for our viewers that are interested in pursuing a, a career with Plain Sense? Is there anything that someone who's interested in, in flying for Plain Sense can do to increase their, um, make themselves a more competitive applicant and increase their chances of becoming um, one of your colleagues? Yeah, um, so we get a lot of applications uh, every year. Um, and we have been doing a lot of hiring, um, but even when we're not hiring, there's, there's a ton of interest. Um, if you've been following us, it, and when we do a lot of school career fairs, we'll get somebody who's just doing their private pilot training. Um, and then at the same time, on the, the top end, we're getting guys that are retiring from the airlines with uh, you know, 30,000 hours. So the, the range of people who are interested in us and who have heard of us uh, is pretty wide. Um, so if you've been following us, or if you will follow us, You'll see that sometimes we're hiring at you know a thousand hours. Sometimes it's seven fifty. Legally, we can go as low as five hundred. Um, so it's kind of all over the place within that little range there. So my my point with that is don't be discouraged at all. You know that a lot of that is a it's a legal number first of all from the five hundred standpoint. But then a, a lot of it is you know based on what's what's out there, what our needs are. Um, but it it should show that the actual number is not super important to us. Uh, what we care more about is the type of person that we're hiring. Um, so we say a lot of times we like to hire the person, not the logbook. Um, so we really want to focus on some, some really good things that can set somebody apart. In our interview, we do three parts. It's a technical interview, basically uh, approach plates and bro uh, briefing and approach and basic VFR and instrument knowledge. It's not rocket science. It's all in the books. And it's, not in any way meant to weed people out, although it does. Um, but our biggest thing is the instrument proficiency. Um, we do a lot of flying uh, every single year, and it's not like the airlines. We don't have a dispatch center that says, hey, the flight's canceled. Uh, we're going, we're gonna get our flights done. We're gonna get these people where they need to go. So long as it's safe and legal, we are going. 
Uh, we don't fly in thunderstorms. We don't fly in freezing rain. But other than that, we are pretty much gone. Um, so we do really rely on that instrument proficiency. Um, but even almost above that is the customer service. There's no steel bulletproof cockpit door uh, to separate you from the people in the back. You're, you're dealing with these high net worth individuals on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, you're greeting them at the cars, you're loading their luggage, or you're helping them on the airplane, you're talking with them on the airplane. In a lot of cases, you're the, you're the one saying, hey, there is freezing rain where we're going, we can't go, you know, here are the options. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of customer service that comes into the flying and uh, you don't have that in a lot of other jobs. So we really, really rely on that um, due to the nature of the business. Um, so my biggest tip is concentrate on the quality of the aviation experience. Um, a lot of VFR jobs don't do it for us. And it's not that I don't like skydiving pilots, historically VFR type flying jobs uh, have not done well in our training program because, and you know, anybody can stare out the window and motor around for a couple hours to build time and that's fun, but we need to fly in hard IFR. We need departure procedures, ILS approaches, real practical instrument knowledge. So when you're out there looking for opportunities to, to build time, or even if you're just out flying around just to build time, do it IFR. Practice those instrument skills. Rent a simulator every once in a while. Um, if you have an autopilot, fly raw data, you know, instead of uh, being on the autopilot. So the instrument skills is absolutely number one. Um, we really like flight instructors, uh, people with tech, uh, you know, technically advanced aircraft, uh, because the PC-12 is very advanced. Um, and of course, anybody with any sort of prior uh, 91K or 135 experience, prior airline experience, um, that's always good. So uh, my number one is concentrate on the quality of the experience. Perfect. And if someone um, already had their, you know, their CTP completed or a single engine ATP, does that make them a more desirable candidate to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we definitely like that. So for the PC-12, uh, specifically to be a PC-12 captain, um, you only need a commercial pilot's license. That's it. Um, even to be an SIC in the jet, you only have to be a commercial pilot. Uh, but for our jet captains, we do need naturally to have the, uh, the ATP. So when we are selecting people to do their, their jet upgrade, we of course pay for their ATP, CTP, and we do their ATP check ride. But uh, it's, it's great if we can skip that altogether. And time-wise for you, that's, that's a big you know, uh, leg up. You know, it's less training that you have to do with us down the line. It, it picks up the upgrade process. Um, it's always good to have extra things like that, uh, especially, I mean, that's an ATP or the ATP CTP is a milestone thing. So to have that already done is, uh, is definitely a good thing. And that shows us, too, that you're serious about your career in flying. Perfect. And then, um, so our last question before we open it up to Q&A from our viewers, if you had one piece of advice, either related to flying or, or aviation in general, to give our viewers, what would it be? Um, so I think number one, I, I would, I'll circle back to what I said last time. Don't jump at every single opportunity uh, that you can come across to, to build time. There is such thing as a bad job out there. There are plenty of things that when I'm reviewing applications, I know whether you're gonna make it through training um, just by looking at your resume based on your, your job history. I just know it, I have a, a sense about it and we've seen it historically. So, you know, don't work for bad operators, do your research, um, you know, just like I said, concentrate on the quality of the experience. Another thing that uh, you don't really think about early on in a uh, aviation career, is the things that you do outside of work or outside of aviation that can affect your career uh, long term. So stay clean. Just follow rules. Don't get in trouble. Um, there's things that may not be a big deal in this country that are big deals uh, internationally, flying ICAO. Um, and I'll give you a, a, probably the biggest example is a DUI. A DUI can wreck your flying career in the US. Um, but any sort of offense like that, uh, prohibits your entry into Canada, for example. We do a ton of flying in Canada. They won't admit you, so we can't hire you because of that. If you can't do your job 100%, um, 
um, you really have no value to us. Um, so stay clean, both in flying and in uh, you know, your personal life. Perfect. Well, thank you both for taking the time to discuss uh, those questions with us. We're now going to open it up to our viewer Q&A. Um, we did actually have a couple that came in via email before our webinar, so I'm going to go over them first. Um, Robert is actually a future student of ours at Peachtree, and he um, is unfortunately working today, so he said he's going to tune in and watch this later. Um, he obviously being at Peachtree, he's very interested in plain sense. Um, he's just curious, you know, if you, how many people you have that maybe do, like you talked about before, that 15, 20 year career, um, and what the average time would be to transition from the, the PC-12 to the 24. So um, our transition time is a tough thing to quote, uh, because it, it depends on how many airplanes we, we get, how many jet airplanes we get. Uh, so the PC-12, like we mentioned in the numbers there, we have 35 PC-12s. Um, that number pretty much stays flat. Uh, over time, over the history of the company, we've had like 60 PC-12s or something. Uh, we sell old ones, we buy new ones, uh, we roll over shares, we, we sell new shares. So that stays pretty flat. Um, so because it's flat, it's kind of easier to predict. Uh, the jet is a growing fleet. Um, and you may see a lot of companies out there, you know, in the news, and you'll see that they bought 30 new airplanes. That's not something that we do. Our owners buy shares in the airplanes. That's how we acquire new airplanes. Um, we don't take on an airplane until we've sold the shares in, in that airplane. So uh, my point is that the growth of the jet fleet is only as fast as we can sell shares. And that's obviously very uh, economy driven. Um, you know, although the type of people that are buying shares in airplanes are, are not nearly as affected as, uh, as the rest of us are, uh, they are still affected. Um, the good thing about that is an airplane is an asset to them. Um, so that's, that is also job security for us too. Those airplanes still exist. We don't park airplanes. We don't sell airplanes and shrink fleets. We don't, we don't do that. Um, so right now, I think we have PC-12 captains who are SICs in the jet that have been flying here for about uh, five years or so is kind of the average. Um, and, and that should shrink as we get more airplanes, but it's tough to say right now with, uh, with everything going on. Okay. And then uh, we also had a question from, a couple questions from Terrell. He mentioned that flying the PC-12 is on his bucket list and he said he's going to be applying to Plane Sense um, once he completes his flight training and he has enough time. Um, Terrell, I think we answered your first question as far as the first officer minimums right now, uh, but he was also curious, um, aside from the, the time to upgrade that we just discussed, um, what is the, the outlook, you know, and I think you've, you've hit on this a little bit, uh, for expanding the, the turbine fleet. And I think by that, he means the, the uh, PC-24. Right. Um, so the, the plan with that is, uh, and, and I don't want to put words in the mouth of our, uh, our president and CEO, but uh, the plan is to have a comparable size fleet of the PC-24, uh, just like we do with the PC-12. Uh, we like to offer the PC-24 with the PC-12, kind of a whole, you know, you can you can kind of choose whatever you want. And even though you own shares in one, you could still fly in the other, depending on what your mission profile is. Um, so the plan is to have a, a fleet size like that. Um, but the thing that is really unique about Pilatus is that it's not like a big Cessna production facility where there's an assembly line, they could just pump airplanes out. It takes a little while for the airplanes to get out. I mean, it really is Swiss craftsmanship. Um, and the real reason for that is to, is to retain the value on the airplane. You don't want to flood the market with a bunch of airplanes and, and drop the value on them because then what's, what's the point? Um, so the airplanes come out pretty, pretty slow so that uh, the value stays pretty high. So it'll take some time to have a comparable size fleet of, uh, of PC-24s, but that's the eventual goal. Perfect. And then um, his third question was just internal relations in, in relation to everything that's kind of been going on right now with the, the industry. And I mean, obviously, you've been there for eight years, so I'm sure you can speak to that. Like, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the culture? And I mean, I see on social media all the time, you guys are participating in maybe Katie, you can speak to this like volunteer opportunities. And it seems like you really have a strong culture. 
within your company? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll answer the first part and then I'll let Kate, uh, Katie answer the second part. Um, culture is what drives a lot of people to this company. Um, again, it, it's tough to, to sell to, to younger people, but the older people will, will understand we have never missed the birth of a child um, for one of our pilots. You know, we, we keep people flying near their homes. We let people stay home. You know, we never have missed one. Knock on wood, of course. Um, and that's just an example. Of course, there's going to come a day when, when that's going to happen. We can't avoid that. But that's just an example of what the type of company that we work for is. Um, certainly, we have all this stuff going on now. Um, and in the eight years that I've been here, everybody always talks about 2008, 2009, and, and how the company survived that. And, uh, you know, we, we voluntarily furloughed like three or four people, and they all had their jobs back almost immediately back then. That's almost a race now because of what's going on now. Um, this is very unprecedented. We, we're not even remotely thinking about anything like that. Um, people are at home. We're still flying. Um, if somebody's uncomfortable flying, we're dealing with that. It's very case by case because there aren't thousands of pilots that, you know, we can, we can actually manage it one on one. Um, and on the other side of this thing, the flying is going to pick up again. And uh, people will remember that, you know, we, we took care of them. So it is very much a small company culture, um, but the company's not a small company anymore. You know, it's kind of kind of bigger, but uh, we've still retained that same feeling. And to build on to that as well, um, the owner sent out 10 masks to each employee uh, to their home. So if we had to go to the grocery store or something, um, the owner really concerns, con concerns about our well-being. Um, he doesn't want us getting sick as well. Um, so he's been pretty um, understanding and if someone doesn't feel comfortable going into the work environment um, when this is over, he, he's gonna let them work remote as well. Awesome, that's, that's really neat. And I know, I mean, just from getting this set up with you guys, uh, Elaine, um, that I was talking to, I mean, I I know that she's worked there for quite a while since I, I was first at ATP in 2011. So it's great to see that you guys have that, that longevity within your company. Um, looking at our questions, it looks like, Oh, Terrell is here. He said that is great to hear. And he said, thank you to you both. Um, Warren would like to know how has um, coronavirus and everything that's happening kind of just affected your, um, your outlook for the next year or two years? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that one. Uh, the answer is it's, it's too early to tell. Um, and so we, we kind of, we have to play off a, a bunch of different things on that one. Uh, a lot of our recruiting and retention uh, has to do with what the aviation industry is doing in general. You know, are the regionals hiring? Are the majors hiring? Um, what's happening there? What sort of jobs are there out there? Um, so our hiring right now has, has slowed down only because we can't accurately gauge uh, you know, our need. We don't want to be scheduling interviews and scheduling classes and then having to cancel the classes two weeks later. We're, we're waiting until things kind of kind of settle uh, before we get into that. So uh, our hiring need has not changed. Our hiring process has slowed a little bit until we can figure things out. Um, on top of all of this, you know, back to what I was saying about a comparable size fleet of jets and PC-12s, that's a lot of airplanes. That's a lot of airplanes. We need the pilots for those airplanes. And, you know, it was easy when it was New England and when it was the Southeast. But like I also said before, now it's the West Coast and now it's Florida, uh, South America and, you know, the Caribbean and it, it's growing. So we need to match those numbers and, and we can't wait until, you know, this virus figures itself out uh, to do that. So uh, it's too early to really tell, but the plans are still to grow uh, as we have scheduled. And um, Mike, this question is actually for you. How long did it take you to become a Czech Airman? And what are some things you did um, to get there and to make yourself uh, an ideal candidate? Yeah, so the, the, being a good uh, uh, an employee in good standing is, is a big deal. Um, you know, things happen. Nobody's going to have a squeaky clean career. Um, so we're not saying that you have to avoid every little, you know, pothole around there. Things are going to happen. Um, but just being a, a, a good guy, just showing up on time, doing the job, um, having a good reputation uh, with the people that you fly with, 
Uh, people need to be confident in both your flying skills and your personality. Um, you know, we don't, we don't hire cowboys. We can't do that. Um, you don't want the CEO of some company, you know, nervous that he's in the airplane with you because he's had a bad experience with you before. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of important. Um, let's see, I was a PC-12 first officer for about a year and then I upgraded to captain, became an instructor pilot about a year after that and then a Czech airman the following year. Um, and, and that's been, been great, you know, so the first step obviously is becoming a PC-12 instructor pilot. And to get there, you just have to be a, a good quality captain. And we solicit for the instructors and we interview them. And, um, you know, as in part 91K and 135, you don't have to be an actual flight instructor, but we do ask that our, our uh, instructor pilots are flight instructors because we want to teach, you know, good things and we do all of our training in house. So uh, we want to be able to keep that going. So I guess that's a long answer to a short question, but. Uh, I think that that covered it. Um, and this next one's for Katie, and this is from Tom. Oh, Tom's one of our alumni. Hey, Tom. Um, Katie made the statement that you have to be within 100 miles of a reporting base and uh, mentioned about being airlined. Oh, looks like he lives 102 miles. He's done the math um, from BWI. Would he be traveling via airline up to save Boston or would he potentially have a, a trip at, or is he able to take a, a trip, you know, pick it up from the closest um, base and do pilots, um, do pilots fly there? Uh, Tom, you're gonna have to give a little clarification on that second question, but I'll let Katie answer the first about the, the travel. Um, so yeah, if he lives two miles over, that's completely fine. We just want to make sure you're able to get there um, if you're on home standby in enough time. Um, and if you're going to be potentially airlining sometimes, if we have an aircraft at your base, say your base is Boston, um, if we're able to get you on that aircraft, you're not going to be airlining. But if we don't have an air, an air at your base, we're going to be airlining you from your base to that aircraft. Okay. And do you have, I think what he's asking is, do you have any pilots that fly up uh, their own plane up to their base? Uh, no, not that I know of. Um, Mike might know of any, some, but I don't know of any. Mike, do, do any of your uh, pilots have their own aircraft that they use in lieu of airlining to their base? Uh, you know, I don't really know. Um, I know we used to have somebody in Portsmouth that would fly to work every once in a while. Um, but to be honest, uh, so long as you show up to work when you're told to show up to work, um, your mode of transportation is uh, up to you. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, Paul would like to know, um, do you have a training contract or a, a contract that, you know, contractual obligation once you're hired on with PlaneSense? Do you want to talk about that, Mike? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we do have a, a, a 12 month, or I'm sorry, an 18 month contract for new hires. Okay. Um, it's all prorated though. Um, so, you know, depending on if you leave during the contract period, uh, that month that is reduced by the uh, number of months remaining on the contract. And right now, as far as hiring, Tim would like to know, um, are, you, are you interviewing? Are you hiring into a pool? Um, what does that look like with your, your current applications? Yeah, so um, due to the coronavirus, we've actually had a large amount of applications. Um, people are being laid off, people are being furloughed. So we're having more applicants um, than we've seen in a long time. Um, we are still hiring. The process was kind of put on hold for a little bit. We were just doing web interviews. Um, that was the technical portion. So it was a part with one of the chief pilots. Um, and the next step after that is to bring the candidate into Portsmouth, New Hampshire to meet with human resources and to do a sim evaluation. Um, and so that part's on hold right now. Um, we're in the steps of figuring that out. Um, New Hampshire still is on a stay at home order. So most of our candidates would be airlining to us. So we don't wanna risk their safety um, and bringing them to our facility as well. Um, so we're really just trying to figure out the next steps for that. Okay. All right. And uh, Vitaly is age 20. So he's just wondering if you guys have a age requirement as far as hiring. No. Perfect. Awesome. 
And uh, Connor, oh, Connor is one of our alumni also. How long does it normally take to hear back after submitting an application? Um, if he was able to interview, any recommendations on how to prepare for the, the HR interview? Um, yeah, so people that are applying right now might take a little bit longer just because we're having such a large amount of applications come through, but you should typically hear back within one to two days from um, someone just saying, your application is pushed forward to one of our chief pilots, we'll let you know the next steps, or um, you might not have enough hours, et cetera, and we'll tell you how to build those hours um, and just to stay in contact with us. Okay. And as far as any recommendations, um, how to prepare for the HR interview? Um, honestly, the HR interview is bringing you up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire to meet with us. It's not necessarily an interview, um, a pass or fail. It's kind of just so you can see the building, see our facilities, um, just learn about the position more in depth. Okay, it's more interaction based. Um, are yeah. there any plans to add crew bases west of the Rocky Mountains? Uh, yes, um, but the, the flying has to take us out there first. Um, so our only physical location is Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, it's our only maintenance base. It's our only, uh, you know, plane sense owned facility. It's where a lot of the airplanes cycle through uh, and where a lot of the business is done because of the, the tax rules in New Hampshire. Um, so all the bases that you see are just pilot reporting bases. It's a place to show up and a place to go back to at the end of the week. Um, and a lot of those bases uh, are there because either we're pushing for recruiting in those areas or uh, current staff members have asked, hey, have you ever thought of Dallas as a base? And we'd say, oh, well, sure, Dallas is a base. You know, it kind of happens that easily. Um, the, the next logical steps, because we've pretty much nailed every uh, city in the eastern half of the U.S., uh, the next logical step is to push west, um, probably starting with Denver and, you know, kind of working our way out that way. So uh, that move is inevitable. Uh, the timeline, I can't really, can't really say. Perfect. All right. So I think we've answered because we had another question about any bases in California. So we also answered that. Um, is there a dispatcher or do you have a dispatch or flight planning department um, as far as taking care of the routes and weather and things like that? Yeah, so our flight operations center, that's where I worked before I was a recruiter. Um, that is consisting of an owner service representative. They're dealing with the owners and booking the flights. Crew service will deal with talking to the crews, um, going over weather, if they have any weather concerns, um, booking hotels, uh, rental cars, all that stuff for the crews, really being the main point of contact for crews uh, to ensure safety. And then we have our scheduling team, who is the one that does all of our um, routes for the day. Okay. And then there's also a maintenance controller as well, who will talk to the crews if there's any um, issues with the aircrafts. Perfect. And oh, this is, again, uh, Terrell would also like to ask another question to Mike. Do you, um, as far as, you know, just what has motivated or encouraged you to, to stay with Plain Sense for eight years? And, um, you know, is this something that you see yourself making a, a career out of continually? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I before I was at Plain Sense, I uh, had done a lot of flight instructing, a lot of flying. I've been flying since I was 16 years old. Um, but like I mentioned, I had worked for the government. Um, my background is in law enforcement um, because it's dynamic, it's exciting, it's always changing. Um, I get bored easily. Um, this is not a boring job. Um, the PC-12 is a fun airplane. Talk to anybody who's ever flown one at any point in their career and they have nothing but good things to say about the PC-12. Uh, I fly the, the Nextant, uh, so I don't fly the PC-24, but if you talk to the PC-24 guys, it's the same thing. It's a pleasure to fly. Um, so that's why I've stayed here because it's been, it's been interesting. You know, you get to go to a lot of cool places. You never really know where you're going until you're there. Um, the, the people that you fly with, um, they're, they're great pilots. Um, this company helps keep your skills sharp. Um, throughout your flight training, you do short field takeoffs and landings and all sorts of stuff like that. That's just practice. Uh, we apply it every single day. And uh, sometimes you're called on to apply that skill uh, at the last minute. You know, 
uh, there's some places that we go to, for example, we can go to JFK all day long. We'll go to Atlanta all day long. We go to an airport in the Bahamas that's about 1,800 feet. Um, you're not going to do that at a lot of other professional flying companies. So, you know, you could be flying an ILS straight into a 10,000 foot runway all day long, and then the phone rings and you're going to that 1,800 foot strip and you're doing a real short field landing for keeps. And when you pull in, there's six people there with way too much luggage. So you're applying all of this, all of these skills that you've learned throughout your flight training, your commercial pilot training, instrument training. Um, so I, I like that. It's very dynamic. Uh, it keeps you pretty, uh, pretty on your toes. Um, and do I see myself staying here for a long time? Uh, yeah, right now it's, it certainly, this is a great example of why it's good to work for a company like this. Um, I'm watching the news of all the impending furloughs. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, and eight years, I have some seniority, but I'm for sure not the most senior person here. Um, but even if I were the most junior person here, I wouldn't be worried about a furlough right now. We just, we don't do it. Um, our CEO is, is very, he's calculated, um, you know, and he's very educated and this is his company. He's built it up. He doesn't really jeopardize the, you know, the, the safety of his employees by stretching himself too thin because everything can be all great one day. And then the next day, you know, it's a worldwide pandemic and companies are furloughing and the economy's crashing and we're, we're trucking along. Um, so things like that remind me how lucky I am to work for a company like this. You know, fractionals in general are, are a safe bet. Um, and, and this one in particular uh, has, has made a lot of the right moves. Okay. And um, is there anything in particular that you look for as far as the online profile after an application has been submitted or do you mostly focus on the cover letter and the resume? Um, so when we're reviewing a pilot application, um, once you commit, once you uh, complete the online application, uh, the HR team uh, sends it to the chief pilots for a review, and we we go through it. Um, and we're looking for all those things that I had mentioned before: the quality of experience. Um, that's that's number one. Um, we definitely want to see see stuff like that. So, uh, but other than that, you know, cover letter and the application completed. Uh, we want to make sure that you're checking all the boxes too. You know, if uh, lately with a lot of the airline guys, uh, they don't have a commercial single. <laughs> you know, everybody who's been flying for a long, long time just gets their multi ATP, goes to the airlines, and they run off. Um, so, you know, don't apply if you don't meet the the basic requirements. Um, certainly, we're looking for things above and beyond. But that's that's about it. I don't know if Katie can uh, can add to anything to that. Um, that's really, he summed it up pretty well. Um, we just look for all the main requirements, um, mostly the hours, and then we send it to the chief pilots to review um, and whatever they say, we then reach out to the applicants. Okay. And um, do you ever do, uh, I mean, typically, at least to my knowledge, it's always dual pilot flying. Are there ever any um, instances where you fly single pilot? No, uh, although the airplane is a single pilot airplane, we are required to have the two pilots. Um, we do not train for single pilot operations, so we don't ask our pilots to do it. Perfect. What does a typical day uh, for a pilot look like? Um, that's a very common question, and my very common answer is there is no typical day. Um, it, it depends on the time of year, it depends where in the country you are, but uh, I'll, I'll Give you kind of a snapshot i'll just make up a day um things are kind of last minute but not so last minute that you can't plan all right so the night before your your day the flight operations center will send you your day here's where you're going tomorrow you know so you may have anywhere from a 4 a.m show to you know 5 6 7 p.m show depending on you know what happens uh, we don't flop you around you're not going to be 4 a.m one day 8 p.m the next day back to 4 a.m we don't do things like that but uh, we do follow rest rules and duty requirements and everything like that. So when you go on duty, uh, you know, you may have a five minute drive to the airport, usually show an hour before. Uh, half of you will go out and pre-flight the airplane, get it all catered and ready to go. The other half of you will do the, the flight planning 
and uh, file all that, communicate with the Flight Operations Center, uh, you know, check for any sort of concerns with weather or anything like that. Um, as far as the flying goes, we're about 50-50 utility uh, in our flying days. We reposition the airplane empty, pick somebody up, take them where they have to go. We'll then fly on somewhere else empty, and so on and so forth. Um, there are instances where you may fly somebody to a destination, wait for them, and then return. Um, or you may fly to a destination and there just happens to be another uh, owner to pick up there. Um, so it, it all is kind of dynamic. And on the very, very low end of that, there may be not much flying for you to do. So you may be the standby crew to pre-flight an airplane and sit with it should another aircraft break or a, a call uh, come in that you know an owner wants to go somewhere. Um, so it, it really, really varies. Okay. Do you do any um, overnights? We do. We do a lot of overnights. We overnight about 200 uh, days a year. Um, so our schedule, as we've mentioned, is eight and six, eight days on, six days off. You can expect to be on the road for those eight days. Um, Portsmouth pilots do a lot of day trips. Uh, not a lot, but they, they have the highest probability of a day trip um, because that's where the maintenance is taken care of. And, uh, you know, in the summertime, there's a lot of flying there. But other than that, you can expect to leave on day one and return on day eight. And it looks like Tom would like to know, he is a CFI, he has approximately 700 hours, um, and he, right now he's instructing in steam gauges. Is there any type of additional experience that you would, you know, have preferable TAA experience, G1000 SIM experience, something to make him a more desirable candidate? Yeah, so um, our PC-12s are all glass cockpit. They're the Honeywell Apex uh, system. Um, G1000 is good too. Um, just having some basic knowledge of that stuff uh, is pretty, is, uh, is good tools to have. Um, we haven't really come across a lot of uh, individuals who have had trouble transitioning from a steam gauge to the uh, glass cockpit because it is very intuitive. Um, with that being said, our biggest challenge is with retired um, like airline type pilots who are transitioning to the glass cockpit because they're so used to what they're used to. Um, so if, if you're building time now in a glass cockpit airplane, uh, that's great. If it's a steam gauge airplane, that's great too. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the instrument scan that you develop from steam gauges uh, is, is pretty good as compared to uh, the glass cockpit, but that's just the way that the world is kind of leaning towards. So you're not hurting yourself by, uh, by flying steam gauges. Perfect, and he, he did have a follow-up question. How does um, plain sense balance just demands with, um, with owners wanting to get somewhere and safety? Is there um, a, a corporate type role that helps support the, the PIC in, in those decision-making or instances where um, maybe the owner wants to, to go somewhere and it's not feasible due to weather or conditions? Yeah, uh, so that's, that's a great question. Um, there are a series of uh, management pilots, myself included. Uh, so they're, they're chief pilots, assistant chief pilots, um, some of our operations people, but there's, there's a 24 hour a day contact that you can, you can reach out to if you're having an issue um, trying to make a decision or maybe you have a, an upset owner. Um, we will always have your back. Um, we place a lot of the emphasis on the PIC. This is, you know, it's, it's your call. If you're saying that it's not safe or you're questioning the legality, we are never going to force anybody to, to fly, you know, ever. Um, safety is number one, especially to a company like this. Um, you know, we, we really, and our owners know that too. They're, they're familiar with how things go for the most part. Do they get upset sometimes? Of course. You know, uh, and it's, it's like anything else. You know, if you want to go somewhere and you're counting on going and for some reason that day an airplane breaks or you know, the weather is, is not feasible. You have to deal with that, that person. That's where your customer service skills come in. Um, you may have to stand there and kind of take your licks, um, but you're the one flying the airplane and you're in charge of not only their safety, but your own safety. Um, so we would never ask somebody to do something that's unsafe or illegal. And, and as managers, we're for sure there to, to help uh, facilitate that conversation with the owners.
Perfect, thanks. Hopefully that answers your question, Tom. He's one of our current instructors out in California. Um, as far as reviewing an application, um, what do you look for in terms of, of just flight schools? Um, do you do you want someone to have trained? You know, is it is it advantageous to train uh, back to back throughout all of your ratings? Um, is that your your question, Diana? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, just know. just in terms of, of looking at somebody's um, flight history, so not just their you know edu their education um, portion of their resume. Is there something specific that you, you look for? No, not really. Um, you know, if you want to go to the, one of the big flight schools, and then fine. Or if you've always wanted to be a pilot but couldn't afford it, and you know, throughout your 20 year career somewhere else, you've you've obtained all your ratings and licenses and built time and everything. That's fine too. Uh, everybody's different. We really value uh, a diverse background and quality of experience over almost anything else. Um, so we, we have a lot of agreements with a lot of like university flight schools and you know kind of bigger name schools. Yep, exactly. Um, so you know that's that's always great to have. We would love to see that, and uh, you know you will have you know slightly higher preference. You'll it's an attention getter, but we would look at somebody that has taken 20 years to do their flight training because they were living their lives, um, we wouldn't say no to them because there's there's somebody else, uh, who, you know. Just take them a so, little longer to get there. <laughs> yeah, you know, everybody is different. We, we value that. And uh, Derek just wanted to know, following up on your scenario with the 1800 foot runway, how do you deal with that if there's too much luggage? Uh, you have to be creative. Um, and again, we rarely fly people who have never flown with us before. Um, so everybody knows the game. Um, you know, whether it's you have to ship some stuff, you have to leave people behind. Uh, and for the record, this, this happens infrequently because the PC-12 is a workhorse. It really is. Uh, if it can fit in the airplane safely as it's designed, we can take it almost every time. Um, our pilots also do all the weight and balance. Um, so if it does not fit your weight and balance profile, uh, or you can't make the trip because of it, you can't depart safely, then you're not taking it. And, and that is on you to get creative. Um, you know, we, we ship things. It, it happens. Uh, our owners and our clients, they understand that. Um, we've also had instances where there's a second airplane, you know, so we, we divvy up luggage onto the second airplane. Um, you know, it, it happens. You just have to work with the owners as, as professionally and tactfully as possible to you know, advise them that it's unsafe. You know, you can't legally depart, uh, you know, under those conditions. Perfect. And guys, it looks like we are getting to the end. So I'm just going to take two more questions. Um, it looks like we have someone with prior military experience on. Uh, Chris would like to know, what is your policy on utilization of flight engineer hours? Yeah, you know, so that's, uh, that's not something we come across very often anymore, of course. Um, so we'd have to check, it depends what the ratio is, um, but individually we can look at that. Katie, you, you may have come across this more than I have, so I don't know if you, if you know, but. Uh, Honestly, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. That so, I know of at least, that I can recall. Yeah, so, Chris, so if, uh, if we can look at it, we can, yeah, we can uh, figure it out. And then, how long is training um, for a first officer position at Plain Sense? So uh, we do our ground schools in-house. Um, so you come up to Portsmouth, uh, about a two-week ground school. Um, and then we send you to Dallas, the flight safety for the uh, sim portion. And it's, it's on average about a week in uh, Dallas at flight safety. Um, so the actual duration from start to finish, it, it varies because we can't send everybody to flight safety all at the same time. We send people in groups of four down there. So if you're in the very first group of four, you'll immediately go to flight safety. If you're in the second half, you'll go home for uh, a week and then go back out to flight safety. Um, so it, it varies, but, uh, but sometimes it can be a nice compact month and other times it's, you know, month and a half, two months, depending on the class size and, and where you fall in the class. Well, 
Guys, we are getting to the end of our session. I just want to say, Katie, Mike, thank you so much both for joining us today. Um, for our viewers, if you do have more information on Plain Sense, you're able to go to www.plainsense.com. And if you do have any questions as far as our upcoming webinars, um, you can go to adbflightschool.com slash webinar singular. And um, next week, we'll be talking with JetLinks. But again, uh, Mike, Katie, thank you for joining us today. We hope uh, a lot of you guys are, are able to connect with them and um, hopefully you're some plain sense pilots in the future. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks you. for Appreciate joining it. us. All right, everyone have a great weekend and fly safe.